There are actually two versions of the parable of the talents, one in Matthew and one in Luke. We will get deep into the details of both of them by filling out this chart. Then we'll draw out some lessons or general principles. So in both versions of this parable, there's a nobleman who goes off into a far country, and when he leaves, he gives several of his servants an amount of money to manage. And they're to take that money, manage it, and try to earn a return on it so that when he comes back, his money will have multiplied. There are two servants who are really successful at this. They take the money that they've been given, they trade and do business with it, and they multiply it to a lot more than it was before. Those two servants are rewarded by the master, but there's a third servant who doesn't do anything with the money. This third servant takes the money, buries it in the ground, and just leaves it there for years and years. That servant is harshly rebuked when the master comes back. He loses the money that was entrusted to him. And in one of the versions of this parable, he's even thrown outside the kingdom and possibly killed. The interpretation of the parable is that Jesus is the nobleman who left his country to be crowned king, and he's someday gonna return, but hasn't yet. The servants are Christians who are on earth and we've been given you know, money by the master, which means in real life, not just our money, not just our wealth or resources, but also our skills, our natural abilities. It could mean our relationships, anything like that, that you know, God has entrusted to us to manage. This chart shows how we'll compare these two versions of the parable in four different categories. What was the amount of money given to the servants? How much did each, each one exactly get? How much profit did each one make? And how, how were they rewarded by the master when he came back? One big difference is the huge amount of money that was given in the Matthew passage compared to the relatively small amount in the Luke passage, about a hundred times less. So Matthew talks about a unit of money that is a talent which was about 20 years wages for a laborer. If you convert that to today's dollars, given recent inflation and all that, it's roughly a million dollars. Now in the other parable, the master gave minas to the servant. A mina was three months wages for a laborer, around 12,000 or $12,500, way less than the talent. Who got what? In Matthew, the three servants were given five talents, two talents, and one talent each. So in other words, five million dollars, two million, and one million. And it says in that, in that version that they were each given an amount that was proportional to their ability. So apparently in the past, this guy who was given five talents had shown a good amount of skill in managing the master's resources, so he was given more. Now even the even the one who was given one talent, notice that that's still a huge amount of money. He was given a million dollars to manage. So apparently this servant had probably been pretty successful in the past with the master in order to get this much money. We can contrast that with the Luke passage where each servant, so in this case there are 10 servants and they're each given one mina each. What were the returns that each of the servants got? In the Matthew passage, the guy who was given five talents made five talents more. The one who was given two talents made two talents. So both of those doubled their money, which is a pretty amazing return. The third servant made nothing at all. He gave back the one talent to the master, but he had nothing to add to it. In the Luke passage, one of the servants actually took his one mina and was able to multiply it 11 times. So he gave back the master the original mina plus 10 additional minas. Similar for another servant, except he multiplied it into six minas, so he had five additional minas. The third servant returned the master the one mina and nothing else. So in that way, the two parables are really similar. How are the servants rewarded? In the Matthew passage, the, the rewards are clearly good, but they're a little vague. So it says, um, for the two who doubled the money, they're definitely getting promoted because the master said, you will be set over much. You've been faithful in little, you'll be set over much. So some kind of promotion. Uh, and in, in addition, it says they'll enter into the joy of their master. So it doesn't really tell us what that means, but it's clearly a good thing. Also, 
the servant who multiplied the five talents into 10, he got one extra talent to manage. So instead of 10 million, now he's got 11 million. And that one talent was, was given to him from the account of the guy who didn't do anything with it. So the master took away that servant's talent. And it said he was thrown out into a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So maybe he was tortured or possibly killed. Um, clearly a pretty bad, pretty bad result for the servant who didn't do anything. Now in the Luke passage, it says that the servant who multiplied the one mina into 11 minas was given charge of 10 cities. The servant who um, multiplied his minas from one into six, so five additional minas, he was given five cities. The third servant who didn't do anything with his mina, his mina was taken away and given to the first servant. Okay, that's a lot of numbers we just went through. Let's just pick out a few of these numbers and see if we can draw some conclusions and lessons from them. In the kingdom of God, there will be work to do. In the analogy of the parable, the servant's rewards are being given to them after the master or the king returns. So this is work that we'll get to do when Jesus returns. For me, this is reassuring. The image of heaven where we're all just like, sitting on clouds, playing harps, or um, constantly singing. I don't think, based on the Bible, that's the only thing we're going to be doing all the time. We're going to have productive work to do. It won't be with all the sweat, blood, and tears that we have on this earth, um, but there will be satisfying work to do in heaven, and I'm glad for that. Work itself is not a result of the fall. Even Adam was given work to do before the fall in the Garden of Eden. These huge responsibilities that the servants were given, you know, managing 10 cities or five cities, that sounds like a lot of work, but it's probably also really satisfying work. Okay, second lesson, also from the book of Luke. These servants had the same starting point, but they were promoted based on their results. So although we're all saved by grace equally, there's still some responsibility for us on this earth that will partially determine our responsibilities in his kingdom. So that should give us caution. You know, grace is not just to be taken in and enjoyed for our own sake, saying, you know, God has done all the work, now I don't have to do anything. Those who have really taken a little, taken this small mina and multiplied it, will be rewarded by him in the end. The third lesson, now from the Matthew passage, is that equal growth led to roughly equal reward. The guy who was given five talents doubled his money. So did the guy who was given two talents. The amount they each earned was different. You know, five and two was the profit. They both doubled, so in percentage turns, they both got the same return on the money and they were both given the same rewards. Uh, enter into the joy of the master and a promotion to be set over much. You know, it's easy for us as humans just to judge people based on their ending point. Where are they now? You know, what's their success in this life? What's their maturity or character? But God knows where each of us started. He knows that for some, he gave them a much easier starting point in life. Maybe a family that was put together well, money, education, all kinds of resources. Others were placed into very difficult situations and it was a struggle even to start to dig themselves out of those. God knows that. He knows where he started each of us. He knows all the details, all the information. The fourth lesson shows up in both versions of the parable. Preserving what we have is just not good enough. Remember the third servant in, in both parables, he didn't do anything with the money. A sobering reminder for us that you know, whatever we've been given in life in terms of talents, gifts, abilities, money, relationships, all those things need to be used and grown. There's another thing here that I'm not gonna talk about in this video, but I'll do it in a future video. In the parable of the minas, these guys were given really small amounts of money, about $12,000 each. One guy who multiplied that into $120,000, he was given charge of 10 cities. So we're just talking orders and orders of magnitude, more responsibility. And I think this is one of the coolest things about the whole parable, but that will be in a future video. Like the servants in the parable, the king has given you and me something to manage. 
It may not be $5 million or even $12,000, but the amount really doesn't matter. He's looking for faithfulness in the small things. Handle those small things well and know that he sees you. In this parable, the servants were acting as stewards of the master's money. But what does stewardship mean? How does it differ from ownership? If you're curious about that, watch this video next.